get so obsessed with a movie or TV show that you feel like you know the characters personally? Well, for one amateur filmmaker named Mark Twitchell, he took that obsession to the next level. This dude was so invested in the horror film he was making that he decided to bring the fictional story of the executioner to life by catfishing a single middle-aged man and knocking him out IRL. In September 2008, Mark was busy shooting a short film in a garage he was renting in Canada. The short was titled House of Cards, and it was a horror story with a plot that was strangely familiar to the TV show Dexter. So the main character of Mark's story did this whole thing where he'd target single middle-aged men and catfish them. The dude would make these fake accounts on dating websites pretending to be pretty women and would message these lonely single men to schedule a time and place to meet up. Instead of meeting their potential lover, the hopeful single men would be confronted by the main character who would rob them of their money, torture them, and ultimately send them to their graves. And the lead character who did all the whacking would continue to interact with his victim's friends and family on the internet to make them believe their loved ones were on vacation. If you're unfamiliar with Dexter, the storyline is pretty darn similar to Mark's low-budget short film. But once Mark started shooting his film, he must have not been fulfilled because he decided to live out the plot in real life. Let's get to it. Johnny Altinger was a lonely 38-year-old oil field equipment manufacturer who loved computers and motorcycles, but he was missing one thing in his life. A nice little lady by his side. Lonely old Johnny was really trying to find himself a missus, so he made an account on the dating website Plenty of Fish. One day, as Johnny was scrolling through potential suitors, there was a profile picture that caught his eye. The picture was of a beautiful brunette on the beach in a bikini, and Johnny was like, she's the one. So Johnny started chatting it up with this brunette who said her name was Jen, and Johnny fell fast for Jen. He was so happy and in love with this woman that he started telling all of his friends. Now, Johnny was the first to admit he was a nerd, so all of his besties were so confused as to how he landed someone as hot as Jen. And I have nothing against nerds or hot girls, but this was an observation made by Johnny's superficial friends that caused great concern. So at this point, Johnny still hadn't met Jen in person. When the couple finally set a date and time to meet up, he was over the moon. Johnny's pals were a bit nervous about the whole thing because the couple's meetup spot wasn't on neutral grounds. It was at Jen's house. Something interesting about the meetup location is that Jen didn't give Johnny her address flat out. Instead, she gave him cryptic directions to her home. One of Johnny's besties, Dale, thought that was pretty sketchy, so he asked Johnny to send him the address of Jen's home when he got there. Once Johnny got there, he called Dale to give him an update. On the phone call, Johnny told Dale that he didn't see Jen anywhere, but he did see some random dude in the garage who was filming something. At 7.30 that night, Dale got an email from Johnny saying Jen was home and that he was going back to the house to meet her. Well, Dale was glad his buddy was actually going to be able to meet Jen, but he was still unsure about it, so he called Johnny later that night to make sure he was good. But the call went straight to voicemail. That next morning, Dale called Johnny again and still no answer. When Johnny didn't show up to a motorcycle ride that he and his crew had been planning for quite some time, Dale and Johnny's other friends grew even more suspicious. With still no response from Johnny, Dale, his wife, and one other friend drove to Johnny's place to see if he was there. They knocked on the door and rang the doorbell, but no one answered. They even looked through the back door and didn't see anyone inside. Since the door was locked, the threesome couldn't get in, so they went around to the garage to see if they could find any clues. Johnny's red Mazda hatchback was missing from the garage and all of his motorcycles were uncovered, which wasn't like Johnny at all. This boy kept his bikes covered so they'd stay in tip-top condition. That next day, Dale got another email from Johnny and it was pretty strange. In the email, Johnny basically said he was head over heels for Jen. He said she was taking him on a vacation to Costa Rica so he would be away for a while. But Dale remembered one thing about Johnny. He didn't like hot weather. He also thought the wording of the email was a bit off. Dale knew there was more to the story so he replied to try and get down to the bottom of it. And he was trying to be all sly in his email so he asked Johnny who would be picking up his brother from the airport since he would be out of town. Dale thought Johnny's reply would give him some clues about his odd behavior, but Johnny never wrote back. At that point, Dale reported Johnny as missing to the Edmonton Police Department, but they couldn't really do much because he was an adult. Around the same time of those emails, Johnny's boss was emailed a resignation letter from Johnny. The boss replied to Johnny's email asking where they should send his final check, and again, Johnny ghosted. So all of Johnny's friends had that feeling in the pit of their stomach that something wasn't right. When some of Johnny's other friends were also left on red, the fear started to creep back in. What if something happened to Johnny? An officer took a statement from Dale and said he'd meet up with him later to talk more about Johnny's case, but he never did. And that's when Dale and Johnny's other pals took matters into their own hands. If the cops weren't going to do anything, they were. 
Johnny's buddies decided they were going to break into Johnny's condo to look for clues. Once they pulled up to his pad, the crew was somehow able to sneak in through a window to check things out. When they got inside, it didn't look like Johnny was on vacation. There was food out on the counter, dirty dishes were left in the sink, none of his things looked like they'd been packed up, and that's when the search crew noticed something terrifying. Johnny's passport. Well, if you remember, Johnny said in his email that he was going to Costa Rica with his new lover, but everyone knows you can't leave the country without a passport. Once that connection was made, Johnny's friends went into full-on panic mode and Dell called the cops again. A missing persons report was officially filed and detectives finally began to investigate. The detectives started looking for Johnny's car in airport parking lots, they got in touch with airlines that ran planes to Costa Rica, and even called customs in Costa Rica to see if they had any record of Johnny landing there. But they found absolutely nothing. No one knew where Johnny or his car was. In an interview with Dale, officials found out about the last time Johnny was seen right before his meetup with Jin. And that's when detectives were all like, Oh, this is bad. Dale told investigators about the weird instructions Jen had sent Johnny to get to her house. So they followed the directions and landed at a normal looking house, or at least it looked normal on the outside. They started talking to other people in the neighborhood to see if they could find out more about the house, and that's when someone told them the garage was often rented out to other people, and no one knew who this so-called Jen was. After doing some digging, the police found out the garage was being rented by a movie buff named Mark Twitchell who was using the space to film a movie. So investigators called up Mark and got to talking. Mark was super cooperative the whole time. He said he didn't know anything about Johnny and agreed to show the garage to the detectives when they asked. As soon as the cops walked into the garage, they were welcomed with a rank odor that smelled like something had been burning. In the middle of the garage, there was a big metal table with sheets of plastic on top. It was basically a replica of the setup Dexter would use to slay his victims in the show. On top of the table was a receipt for bleach, paper towels, gloves, plastic sheets, and some other cleaning items. And all of that stuff screamed suspicious, but Mark told the cops it was all for the horror film he was shooting. And I mean, that would definitely make sense. Before calling it quits, the detectives asked Mark to come down to the station for a formal statement. It was like 3 in the morning by the time Mark arrived and started talking, and he was way too energetic for it to be normal. He told detectives all about his wife, an eight-month-old daughter, and gushed about his film career. The whole time Mark was being interviewed, it seemed like he was telling the truth, but detectives were still confused as to why he said he knew nothing about Johnny when his movie set is the last place the guy was seen. Before detectives went back to search the garage, Mark suddenly remembered a run-in he had with someone that may have been Johnny. So Mark said he was sitting in his car in a parking lot when some random stranger knocked on his window asking if he wanted to buy a car. A red Mazda hatchback, which is the same exact make, model, and color of the car Johnny owned. Mark claimed this man told him he was getting rid of his car because he met a woman who was taking him on vacation so he didn't need it anymore. Mark told detectives he bought the car from the stranger for $40. In addition to that story, Mark came up with a few other fibs to strengthen his case. He told detectives his house had been broken into and claimed someone stole a bunch of stuff, including his duct tape, paper towels, and trash bags. He also said his car had been broken into and claimed someone burned something in his back garden. Mark was obviously trying way too hard with all these lies and the detectives knew it. So then they went in on Mark. They told him they knew he had something to do with Johnny's disappearance, but Mark still didn't let up. Since there wasn't enough hard evidence to keep him detained, the investigators let Mark go but put him under surveillance and made plans to search his house and car. When Mark's house was searched, investigators found a bunch of books about forensic science, mass executioners, and wait for it, Costa Rica. Other interesting items found by officials include a black hockey mask with vital fluid on it, a stack of unused postcards, and a lot of sticky notes with strange messages on them such as kill, room, clean, sweep. In Mark's car, investigators found blades with vital fluid on them, a red stain on the carpet, and a laptop with two temporary files, one of which was titled SK Confessions that outlined the story of a mass executioner doing a bunch of terrible things in graphic detail. And the guy in the story said he had a wife and eight-month-old daughter just like Mark in real life. The alleged character wore a black hockey mask when committing his crime, so this is all sounding super familiar. At first, officials thought the document was a manuscript of sorts, but it didn't take long for them to realize it was more of a written confession where Mark documented everything he did. In the text, Mark wrote that the fictional villain wanted to go after men who were cheating on their wives, but he thought they'd be missed, so instead he targeted single middle-aged men. 
aka Johnny. Mark's document went on to cover gruesome details about what this character would do to his victims, and let's just say it wasn't pretty. In the text, there was also the story of another man that the bad guy went after before the Johnny-like character, but that victim was able to escape. And sometime around then, someone came to the cops with that exact story. So the week before Johnny's attack, a dude named Gilles had been lured out to the garage by Mark in a similar fashion. When Gilles went into the garage, Mark hit him with a stun weapon and started to put duct tape over his eyes. But Gilles wouldn't give up without a fight. He somehow escaped the garage, but Mark came out and grabbed Gilles' leg to drag him back in. Gilles escaped again and started running down the street. He ran to a couple on the street and begged for help, but Mark, who was still wearing his hockey mask, wasn't too far behind him to tell the couple something along the lines of, it's just a joke, he's my friend, haha. -ha. And I guess the couple wasn't pressed enough to do anything. Gilles made it home and immediately looked at the account for the girl he was supposed to meet, but by that point, it had already been deleted. Mark threatened Gilles into staying silent about the whole thing by saying he'd snuff him, so Gilles kept his lips sealed until he found out about Johnny's case. So now it's obvious that the SK confessions are the true tales of Mark's slayings. Investigators ended up finding a bunch of incriminating evidence in the garage, such as a stun weapon, handcuffs, duct tape, a fluid-covered lead pipe, and a game processing kit that was clearly used on humans instead of animals. But at that point, officials still didn't know where Johnny was, and Mark wouldn't tell investigators the location of the body until a year and a half later. When he went to trial, he literally said he catfished Johnny out to his garage just to create a sizzle reel for his upcoming film. He seriously told the court that he set up his camera and planned to scare Johnny just to get some promo clips. Mark claimed Johnny found out about the setup and attacked him, so he fought back and ended up winning. Well, Mark was found guilty and received a life sentence with the opportunity of parole 25 years in. As if you need another reason to hate Mark, his wife found out he'd been cheating on her with an ex-girlfriend. He also got laid off without telling her, so he would legit hang out in his garage or go to his parents' house during his office hours. Mark is still serving time in prison, where he spends his time scrolling through potential suitors on a dating site he joined that's specifically for inmates. So what ended up happening to Johnny that fateful day? Once he showed up to the meetup spot, Jen told Johnny she was waiting inside. When Johnny walked in, he didn't see Jen anywhere, but he did see a big metal table with sheets of plastic on top. It looked an awful lot like the setup from Dexter. Moments later, Mark came at Johnny with a blade and a lead pipe and whacked him out for good. Mark then cut Johnny up and tried to burn the pieces, but that didn't go as planned, so he went to plan B, which was to toss the remnants down the sewer. After the fact, Mark literally went to his laptop and started writing a new story. He also tried to keep up with Johnny's emails to make it look like he hadn't just kicked the bucket. At the end of the day, a poor lonely man lost his life for no good reason at all. Was Mark really that committed to his craft that he got carried away? Or was he simply a sick villain who knew exactly what he was doing? I think he's flat out crazy, but that's not your theory, that's mine. Thanks for watching everyone, and be careful out there on those dating sites.